Spent my summer in the van St. Augustine to To Michigan Held my breath Said a prayer All those people waiting there I've been searching so long It lived in me all along Burn me in the desert And drown me in the rain Throw me to the thunder Bright lights, sharing tears Thanking grace for bringing us all here It ain't lonely on the road When there's love everywhere you go I've been searching so long It lived in me all alone I'm a warrior I'm a warrior I'm a warrior We are warriors Burn me in the desert And drown me in the Welcome and glad you're here to join us today. We have a few uh, disclosures to, to go ahead and read. Emily. Yep, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so some participation tips. If you want to ask a question at some point, please do the raise your hand button. That's how we know we can unmute you and also um, can call on you. We're building a community. Please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Um, share your name, your tribal affiliation, if applicable, and any um, organization you work for. Um, and you will receive a link at the as you exit. Once you exit the Zoom, a, a, a link will pop up, and it will be a survey, um, an evaluation survey that um, we would really appreciate your feedback on. We're also, next slide, please. 
Okay, so we have um, nothing to disclose. This activity is jointly provided by the United South and Eastern Tribes. If you have any questions, um, please direct them to Ms. Natale. I think her name's on the next slide. Next slide. No, oh, well, there are no real. Okay, no, third slide. Yeah, okay. So if you have any questions um, about uh, continuing education information, please direct them to Ms. Natale, Kayla Natale. Um, we are offering continuing education units, uh, medical units, nursing units, and social work units today. And you do need to fill out that evaluation at the very end in order to get those. Um, and also, if uh, none of those categories apply, but you still want credit, we can um, give you an attendance certificate too. Uh, you can just indicate that on the evaluation. And that is all I have. Welcome all my relations. Mitakue Oyase. Um, I am Bernice Jordan. I am one of the public health program managers at USET. So we just want to acknowledge that you are on a tribal nation land and your organization where you are standing at right now. Um, just to, you know, a little bit further, if you go to this website, uh, nativeland.ca, you could find out where you are located at this moment, um, or you can text to this phone number and enter your uh, zip code or city. Next slide. So we are uh, reconnecting our indigenous community. Thank you all for being a part of reclaiming our collective stories. Um, if you look at the dots, this is where you all are located. Um, we just wanted to show you a fresh picture of where you are standing today. Next slide. I would like to, I would like to introduce Holly um, Echo Hawk. Um, so Holly, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi everybody, Holly Echo Hawk here. I'm really super happy that you all have joined us today. Um, I wanna do uh, two things, <laughs> one is just to say that uh, this series was developed um, and with partnership with USET. Uh, and it is a celebration and acknowledgement of native psychological brilliance. And you know that we intentionally use the term reclaiming because reclaiming assumes that it's always been there. We're just putting it to the forefront. Um, and it is a year long series, the, the fourth Tuesday of every month, same time, same place, so stay tuned. Um, and then in January, some of you have, were, have been with us each month, but in case you haven't, we launched in January. It was an introduction to the reclaiming series and the reclaiming concept of psychological brilliance, um, which I presented on that day, uh, February, February, we focused on nurturing psychological brilliance and resilience in Native young adults. <clears throat> so we had the, in the, the Indigenous education folks, um, Cobell Scholarship, and the Indigenous, uh, and they talked about the Indigenous concept, which I love, and uh, Melvin, the CEO of Indigenous Education, and Mal Mal uh, Alani Fox talked about the Indigenous group. Then we had two students, Zoe Harris from Mashpee Wapanog, uh, fabulous PhD student now in Chicago, and Johnny Buck, um, who is uh, Wanapum and Yakima from the Columbia River Gorge area, and they were just fantastic. So uh, if we can go to the next slide. So today, what a treat you're in for today. Today, we're going to um, Jeff King is going to talk about some and provide some really fascinating, fabulous, exciting, validating information about native brilliance. So after you listen to this today, it is going to generate discussion uh, amongst you and your staff and your organization and your community about the assumption of native brilliance what a powerful impact Native brands has had on the broader world, not just here in the United States, but everywhere. Uh, he's specifically going to talk about Native influence on 
modern, the evolution of modern psychology and how Western in science and Western behavioral health has influences behavioral health training. And last but not least, the need to decolonize mental health and substance use treatment for native people. So with that, I wanna introduce my friend and colleague and relative, Jeff King, and he and I have worked together for at least 30 years. <laughs> and we're just thrilled to have him here. And I know you're going to enjoy his presentation. So Jeff. Thanks, Holly. Uh, um, greetings in my language. Um, I guess first and foremost, what I'd like to do is acknowledge the Lummi and Nooksack tribes upon whose land we here exist. Um, I think it's, you know, I'm glad that there was this land acknowledgement. Um, I think it puts things a bit more in perspective um, if we connect to our historical roots. So uh, do I have access to the slides or do I just say next slide? Just say next slide. Next slide then, thanks, Brian. There we go. Uh, one thing I like to do in my presentations is to um, show um, families and children um, sometimes when in presentations you can get theoretical or um, kind of heady in the things that we talk about, and it's important to be rooted and grounded um, in people's lives to see that the things that we're talking about aren't just um, information, but it affects people's decisions, people's view of themselves, um, their life trajectories, and so on, and that this information can be used to actually touch real families' lives, real decisions being made um, and uh, internalized attitudes towards themselves. So these are real people. And I hope that as we're listening, we ground ourselves in you know, families that we know, families that we work with, communities that we work with and so on. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, by way of more introduction, um, I am the, in, in my language, I'm the Ishtaheki in my family, which means white boy. Um, but you can see my grand, there's a picture of my grandfather. Um, and then on the right side, there's a picture of my grandmother. She's the one on the left. My grandmother never spoke English. Um, my grandfather um, did. He was actually one of the first lawyers in Indian country in Oklahoma. Um, next slide. And there's a picture of my mother on the left um, when she was uh, in the military, she was a nurse. She left the community and went into the military. Um, she met my dad here in uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, they got married over in Korea during the Korean War. They got married in their fatigues. Um, um, but when my mother uh, retired, she went back to our tribal community just because she um, she just said, oh, Jeff, I just want to be around my people. I just want to be able to speak the language. And she did retain her language her whole life. Um, but uh, it, it was English was her second language. She didn't speak English until she was grade school age. Uh, and she went to Shilako Indian Boarding School, the same boarding school Holly went to, but I think it was about 40 or 50 years later. So um, that Holly went. And then uh, there's a picture of my family. And as you can see, I'm the whitest one in the family. Uh, that's my mother uh, in her 80s by that time. So just to let you know some context of where I come from, my aunt was on the tribal uh, council for about 13 years, Irene Cleghorn. Next slide, please. And this is just a little bit of my background, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a clinical psychologist by training. Um, for the last 30 years, I've worked in Indian country, different, different capacities. I was director of Native American Counseling in Denver for about 13 years, and we served tribes uh, in a number of states. Um, I was a clinical psychologist following uh, my stint in Denver at the Taos Pickerys uh, health center. This was with, through IHS. I was there for two years. 
Um, and then I have been a professor here at Western Washington University for the last 14 years. Um, I still see Native clients and work with Native communities, um, even in this capacity. Um, some of the background stuff that I've been doing more recently is psychological evaluations for adult Native folks who were sexually abused in the boarding schools. And this is across states and tribes. Um, hard work, but definitely worth it. Um, I've done psychological evaluations and expert witness testimony in child custody evaluations, and that includes ICWA. And then forensic psychological evaluations for people that were um, either headed for prison or leaving prison. And it was for the purpose of um, when they were going to prison, what kind of sentence would they receive? And post sentencing had to do more with uh, what kind of conditions um, would be in place for them as they um, left. And then national and international involvement addressing cultural competency and behavioral health. And that's where Holly and I have linked up over all these years. So next slide, please. And uh, this is the topic of today, reclaiming native psychological brilliance. And uh, what we'll see is that it's always been there. Um, and um, what we're gonna delve into is some uh, sort of a snapshot of where we've seen that historically. So we'll move right into that. Next slide. Okay, I need to shift my view a little bit here. Okay. Um, when uh, I can't really see the whole, what a, let me just see here. Where's the 100? There we go. Um, so this is just some historical snapshots of um, sort of interactions with Western white folks uh, coming to um, uh, America. And when the colonists in Massachusetts uh, first saw indigenous gardens, they, they, they thought that native people didn't know how to farm. Um, and they thought, uh, you know, that you're supposed to plant things in rows and, you know, not in three dimensional sprawls and so on. Uh, and yet they were eager to eat the food that the native, uh, native people supplied, but they didn't realize that the native, that the Iroquois understood how the bean, the corn and squash plants work together to produce abundantly and to maintain fertile soil. Um, and they had a legend, the three sisters, and the corn was the oldest sister. And that was that by the time that she was planted first, and by the time the, the stalk of the corn was up, then that allowed the beans to wrap around the stalk to reach the sunlight, but also the stalk pr provided shade. Um, and then the squash was planted, which provided shade and kept moisture in the ground. And that's just on the surface. And on underneath the surface, the roots and the bacteria and the nitrogen that they released actually fertilized one another in their growth patterns and also kept the, the ground fertile. Uh, so you didn't have to fertilize it and so on. So um, there was genius um, in integrating these plants together. And then another story comes from up in this region where uh, when folks saw that the native people were throwing carcasses of salmon back into the river after they had uh, used the meat and so on, they thought it was superstition. And years and years later, uh, scientists, marine biologists and so on, found that uh, when you release a carcass into the creek, um, nitrogen is released 100 meters in both directions. And it supplies nutrients to the plants on the shore, as well as nutrients in the water. And so now biologists actually have it as a practice to return salmon bones to streams when they're preparing to, to reintroduce salmon to the streams. And so it's become state policy to do this, uh, a native practice. Next slide. Uh, forest burning, you know, we've been talking about uh, we've witnessed the wildfires that have been going on for a number of years now when 
federal fire prevention saw what natives were doing with these controlled burns, they outlawed them, didn't allow native people to practice that. And later they found out that withholding these controlled burns actually exacerbated the conditions to create wildfires. And snow, so now there's a, a big U-turn and they're returning back to tribal knowledge of these burning practices. And what you can see this one fire uh, expert was saying, we need to return back to what indigenous people, their, their understanding and recognize the genius that's there basically and put them into practice. Another fascinating piece of indigenous knowledge is that here up in the Pacific Northwest that they've been investigating the, the Coast Salish stories of these yahoos, the, the uh, yahos, which are spirits associated with the shaking of the ground and rushing muddy water. But they say as they investigate the tales, they can trace these uh, in the stories, they can trace them to specific loca locations. And they found that these are uh, areas of ancient landslides and that they can follow the stories and find fault lines that they wouldn't find otherwise. And so one of the geologists said, if you hadn't heard the stories, you would never be able to find these. So here um, in, the, in the native tradition is, uh, is even knowledge of land and uh, earthquakes. Next slide. Um, I was in Denver at the time that this happened. There was a hantavirus outbreak, very deadly. Uh, people um, were quite scared. People were dying from this and so on. And scientists were really per perplexed trying to figure out where did this or originate. And they got the answer from Navajo elders and medicine people. And they had predicted the outbreak based on weather patterns. And it went back historical in their knowledge and so on. And they were able not only to um, talk about what happened, what conditions, but also treatment uh, for the hantavirus. In another area in the Southwest, um, there are now projects that are looking to plant plants and farming practices that native people have been using for uh, eons um, to draw upon them for potential solutions to the growing worries over future supplies. Um, and uh, Greg Baron Gafford, University of Arizona professor said, learning from and incorporating indigenous knowledge is extremely important um, uh, for us to figure out how we're gonna be doing our crops into the future. So again, this was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, um, irrigation practices and so on, um, still being drawn uh, drawn from with local scientists. Next slide. Um, a lot of you may know this already, some of you may not know this at all, is that the Iroquois Confederacy had a centuries long democracy um, way before settlers came. And this Confederacy strongly influenced the US Constitution. And this is from a 1751 letter from Benjamin Franklin writing to the colonies where he's calling for a, uh, the colonies to form a volunteer union similar to that of the Iroquois Confederacy. And what we don't read in the history books is that Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and other founding fathers were visiting with the Iroquois regularly and asking questions like, how do you govern yourselves without a king? Because in practice, all they've known were aristocracies. They'd read about Greek and Roman democracies, but they never saw one in practice. And here was one right beside them with the Iroquois Confederacy. And this had been going on for hundreds of years for the Iroquois. And so Franklin writes in this letter, um, you can see sort of the, the bias in his mindset still, but he does say it would be a very strange thing if six nations of ignorant savages show that they are capable of forming a scheme for such a union and be able to execute it in such a, a manner as that it has subsisted ages and it appears indissoluble. That it's not, you can't break it apart. And yet our union should be impractical for 10 or a dozen English colonies. So he's basing this on what he's seeing in a living democracy and saying, if they can do it, surely we can do it 
and they drew from uh, the Iroquois democracy to form our own. And uh, the United States didn't formally acknowledge this. Uh, Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, uh, chair of the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs, helped Congress pass a 1988 resolution where they formally acknowledged the influence of the Iroquois Confederacy on the US Constitution. As I said, this typically escapes history books. Next slide. So then what I would like to do is move into psychology and psychological theory and talk about native influence on current psychological theory. And also, as we delve into this, we'll look into worldview and see how this Western worldview anchored in Western science and psychology actually presents an obstacle in working with indigenous clients. So two, two aspects here. Next slide. Here are the biggies in psychology. Um, you know, I, it's interesting to me that when you're presented with this in your Psych 101 class and so on, and you see these pictures, uh, there's something very glaring about this. One is that it's all white men. There are no women and there are no people of color here. And it's really interesting and it's a good way to think of not only what's present in the picture, but who is absent. Because who is absent contains meaning as well. What this is conveying is these are the possessors of knowledge. These are the people who we should look to for our knowledge and understanding. And the people that are absent, by virtue of them being absent, it conveys a message that they don't need to be listened to. They are not rendered uh, equal importance. So what we're gonna talk about is three of these major uh, theorists in psychology and their uh, interactions with native people and how that impacted them. So next slide. Uh, we'll be talking about Carl Jung uh, and his theory of collective unconscious actually came as a result of his interaction with natives, uh, actually the, the Taos Pueblo. Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how that came from the Blackfoot in Siksika, Canada. And Erickson's stages of development as a result of his work with the Yurok and the Lakota. So uh, we'll be going more into detail. Next slide. Uh, Erickson in his, um, one of the, this is really fascinating to me. And one of the last letters that he wrote a few months be before his death in June of 61, uh, and this was 36 years after his encounter at the Taos Pueblo, but he said, we are sorely in need of a truth or a self-understanding similar to that which I have found still living with the Taos Pueblo. This is Carl Jung, an incredible mind, and 36 years later, he's still thinking about this and recognizing the impact of that kind of worldview that he encountered. Um, and that was the only encounter that he had had with Native people. Uh, it didn't last that long, but it had a, it had a um, tectonic shift, if you will, in his life. Next slide. We'll go into detail more with that. Um, through this one event, he was emotionally forced to reassess his thinking as to which, <laughs> which group was primitive and which group was connected to spirit. That encounter also served as an underground psychic stream in his unconscious that over the, the decades disrupted some of his fixed Western views. And he talks about it in his uh, Memories, Dreams, and Reflection book. Jung was thrust into the unconscious by this exchange and that he was deeply penetrated. He used the word stabbed um, by his encounter with this man, Mountain Lake. This was not a merely an intellectual encounter. He felt himself in the presence of something very numinous. And it was a profound emotional and psychological confrontation for Jung. Okay, next slide. So it's important to understand that at the time that Jung came to Taos, he still held a linear and hierarchical concept of time, history, and culture. He also held to a layered and hierarchical view of the evolution of the psyche. In fact, at one point he had said that native people 
and African American people were 500 years behind Western consciousness. And yet this encounter threw his thinking upside down. So after 1932, he intuited that the psych indeed had parameters that went far beyond linear boundaries and embraced more than one kind of reality. So again, this was a tectonic shift for him, a, a huge upheaval. Next slide. So this is verbatim from his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And these emphasize, what's emphasized um, is to highlight uh, the important pieces. So he's talking to Antonio Mirabal here. He says, I asked him why he thought the whites were all mad, meaning crazy. He responded, they say that they think with their heads. And Jung replied, why, of course, what do you think with? We think here, and he pointed to his heart. And Jung's response to that was that I fell into a long meditation for the first time in my life, for the first time in my life, so it seemed to me, someone had drawn for me a picture of the real white man. It was as though un until now, I had seen nothing but sentimental, pre pretty, prettified colored prints. This Indian had struck our vulnerable spot unveiled a truth to which we are blind. I felt rising within me something like a shapeless mist, unknown and yet deeply familiar. So this was huge. Next slide. So can we go back to the um, previous slide? I just wanted to mention, again, he's saying the first time in his life, this kind of knowledge came to him. And again, 36 years later, just before his death, but several months before his death, he is, he is recalling this time when his, his perspective and worldview dramatically changed. So uh, this is what fed into his whole idea of collective unconscious. Okay, next slide, please. So now we move to Abraham Maslow. Um, you know, his, his uh, hierarchy of, need, of needs um, is uh, used in businesses, in psychology, development, education, and so on. Um, little do people know that uh, Maslow spent um, time among the Blackfoot up in Siksika. And a friend of mine, Ryan Heavyhead, and the late Narcissus Blood, also a friend, friend of mine, um, were able to dig into the, um, the archives of Maslow. And not only that, but they were able to meet with one of the researchers that was with Maslow um, at the time that he visited Siksika. Um, and uh, she was 102 years old, I think, but she was extremely lucid and re you know, could cogently recall the time that they were there. Um, so uh, they, they uh, have some solid research to back up these findings. Next slide, please. Um, before Maslow came to Siksika, he was operating on a theory of male dominance. He was interviewing students at Columbia University. He developed a questionnaire that wanted to get at um, why males dominate females. And this had been from primate studies and he was extending it to human humans. And eventually he quit asking men uh, these questionnaires because he saw that women were more the, the victims of this male dominance. And uh, one of his anthropologist friends suggested that he look at this cross-culturally and have a cross-cultural experience. So um, he was able to go to uh, the Blackfoot Reservation and he was blown away. He discovered astounding levels of cooperation, minimal inequality, restorative justice, full bellies, and high levels of life satisfaction. And in his estimation was that 80 to 90% of the Blackfoot tribe had a quality of self-esteem that was only found in five to 10% of his own population. So here's this guy out of studying hierarchy and male dominance and so on. And he sees, here's a society where this isn't existent. 
in this society. And so then he wondered, what, how, how were these people able to uh, come to this kind of uh, quality of life and self-esteem? So he wondered if it was in the child rearing. And what he found was children were raised very, very different than in Western society. Children were raised with a great permissiveness and treated as equal members of Siksika society in contrast to what he called a strict disciplinary approach found in his own culture. And despite having great freedom, these Siksika children listened to their elders and served the community from a young age. They weren't rebellious, they weren't acting out, they had great respect for the elders and the communities and were involved in serving the communities. And so according to Ryan Heavyhead, witnessing the qualities of self-actualization among the Blackfoot and diving into their practices actually led Maslow to deeper research into the journey to self-actualization. Remember, he was studying male domination, but after his encounter at the Blackfoot, he moved towards studying self-actualization. And this led eventually to the publishing of his Hierarchy of Needs concept in the 43 paper, 1943 paper. Next slide. So uh, in reflection, they were, it was a community whose members as a collective felt self-assured and confident. They interacted altruistic, altruistically and they discouraged competition. And in this world, Maslow quickly learned that it was his assumptions and the systems of thought and practice they derived from or that worldview that were truly deviant. So it was a reflection back on his own Western worldview. And he saw this, is, this doesn't work in the same way that the, the Blackfoot raised their children. So he returned home to Brooklyn. He actually tried to live out what he observed in uh, Blackfoot country in his, uh, his apartment buildings, but people thought he was crazy. You know, he's like, why don't we have a child here? Why don't you share in our child rearing and we'll share in your child rearing and so on. And they just looked at him like, what are you talking about? But what he did do is that he changed his entire research trajectory and he started investigating normal human psychology. And when he remembered his Blackfoot experiences, um, he began to render models and ideas that would eventually transform our Western science. And later in his life, even though Maslow never really I knew somebody that, uh, I know somebody who interacted with Maslow back in the day, and he said he never talked about his experience at Siksika, with me at least. But later in life, Maslow remarked that his experience at Blackfoot shook me to my knees. So next slide, please. Now we're moving to Eric Erickson. And we don't hear this as much. We can read this in, um, you know, um, his book on um, society. What is the title of the book? I'm blanking on it right now. Um, but anyway, um, Childhood and Society. But here's a snapshot of his timeline when he came, you know, um, he actually studied Native Americans while he was in Vienna. Um, but then he, in 33, completed his psychoanalytic training. Same year, he moves to the U.S. and meets some cultural anthropologists. And he's able to travel with one of those to Pine Ridge and of uh, Oglala, Lakota. And then later, he meets with some other anthropologists. And through them, he was able to travel to the Yurok and meet with them. And 11 years later, he publishes the book, Childhood and Society. So that's kind of a, you know, a um, timeline for Erickson. Then I want to delve into deeply, more deeply into how this impacted him. So McKeel was one of those cultural anthropologists that traveled with him. And he knew that uh, Erickson had read and was fascinated, read novels and comic books about Native Americans while he was in Germany. And he read about the Sioux in particular, or the Lakota. And it was in about when he was in Germany, it was pronounced Sioux. Um, but uh, he was excited about being able to, to visit the Lakota. And so when he got there, he found himself deeply impressed by traditional Sioux tribal child rearing practices. 
in Erickson's estimation, the Sioux had a deeply integrated culture in which children felt a sense of wholeness and contentment. And again, his training had been with children. He studied under Anna Freud. She was his uh, primary uh, mentor. Uh, but he'd been working only with Western European children. And so he saw a, a level of wholeness and contentment that he didn't see with uh, white children. And their approach, developmental child rearing approach, contrasted starkly with childhood training in modern Western culture. And he notes that the Sioux actively encouraged their children to be independent. Only when strong in body and sure in self is the Indian child subjective to the inevitable social forces and pressure any society brings to bear on the young. So what he was seeing here was that the Lakota let their children just kind of develop on their own, experience a great deal of independence, and only when they saw this sense of self coming together did they begin to apply some of the social cues and nuances that they needed to abide by. And then he compared that to white American children and said, you know, what we do in the West is only after a first condition of orderliness and compliance is established. So we emphasize in the West Order, orderliness and compliance, like don't do this, don't do that, and so on, then do we allow them in the individual assertion. So it's like the, the Lakota uh, do it the other way and we do it backwards, so to speak. Next slide. So uh, not only yeah, he was he was deeply impacted. I get another one of those tectonic shifts for him, for a psychologist. Um, it encouraged a lifelong interest in comparative and historically grounded cultural studies. Um, and even at the end of his life, he and his wife Joni were uh, traveling to um, Arizona to um, talk with people from the Navajo tribe. I talked with. Erickson's son Kai, and he remembers being in, in um, Navajo country with his parents way back. But so you can see that this interest in uh, indigenous uh, culture and knowledge and so on was one that he held throughout his life. So, but in 39, he traveled to the Yurok, and through observation there, he, he recognized that, um, that there's that culture and external events have a significant impact on behavior. It's not just the nuclear family. He noticed how the Yurok treated the river with respect and taught others to view the river with respect. And he saw that that kind of attitude and that kind of reverence for nature actually was instrumental in child rearing and the child's sense of self. Next slide. So he extended this early work on cultural uh, Yurok of the uh, cu cultural uniqueness of the Yurok and the Sioux into his psychohistorical studies. And Margaret Mead, famous anthropologist, she, she said to him that his life stage view was too close when he was using it in a linear sequential manner, that he had to open its edges to, to permit historical variation. And I would add cultural variation, which was he was getting a full dose of it in his visits with these two tribes. Next slide. So in 1934, observations on the Yurok childhood and world image it shows Erickson thinking very, very different uh, than what he wrote about in his earlier um, work. He had moved a field of education and childhood alone and now was considering adult meanings and mature psychological content and rituals as it impacted children. And what, what Maslow saw among the Blackfoot Erickson was seeing with um, these tribes, the Yurok and so on, is that children weren't just seen as separate, but they were integrated and adult meanings and content, mature content and rituals were also part of child rearing. Next slide. 
So this is what he said. Uh, um, Contrary to every family for itself culture, that's that nuclear family individualistic viewpoint um, of white America with its various, what he called prisons of single family, interesting choice of words, and its isolated places for childhood, meaning separate from the adult world, and its great subdivisions between childhood and adulthood. What he saw with natives was that such care and incorporation into the communal life as a whole made for a sense of oneness with the tribe and among natives of various ages. So he saw that there was much more integration uh, with children and adults compared to what he saw in the white world. Next slide. So, and this is, these are um, words that he has used, but, um, uh, in this particular uh, book by Hora, Hora, he says, compared with what he saw in the harshness of compatriot Euro-Americans, in our worries and our warfare with children and homes and nurseries and our tendencies to pronounce cruel verdicts of constitutional inferiority on children, meaning we're looking at children as inferior we don't include them in our adult understandings and so on, and that we're kind of at war with our kids in trying to um, train them up in the way that they should go. He said the natives were astute or genius in their knowledge and use of developmental readiness. They were confident in themselves and very generous in their love for the young. So he saw more of a holistic way of interacting with their young. The next slide, please. And so again, look at the words that he used here. Amazed at the defeatism of white Americans. By contrast, such natives trusted their children to develop in step with the cultural expectations for that, their competency and participation. Tribal adults were confident that their youth would naturally seek cooperation with the norms and activities of their society. So they trusted that this was going to happen. Thus, there was no need to apply studied methods of subduing and domesticating children or routinizing them in clockwise precision, sort of a mechanical structural model. To Erickson, tribal natives were adept at matching the child's development of language, of locomotion, of exploration, of autonomy, and of readiness for skill development for such growth and inclusion. So he saw that there was genius there, genius that was not matched in the Western world. Next slide. So the value of studying um, other cultures was summarized succinctly by Erickson in an interview with a fellow named Richard Ever Evans. And he says, the interesting thing was that all the childhood problems which we had begun to take seriously on the basis of pathological developments in our cultures, the Indians talked about spontaneously and most seriously without any prodding. In other words, they were right there. They understood this. They referred to our stages as the decisive steps in making of a good Sioux Indian or a good Yurok Indian and good meant whatever seemed virtuous in a strong man or woman in that culture. I, and here's, I, I highlighted this. I think this contributed eventually to my imagery of basic human strengths. So again, this was sort of a worldview challenge for him and tossed his ideas upside down. And so it was actually on the basis of these cross-cultural comparisons that Erickson felt confident in proposing his H stage developmental theory of uh, his eight stage theory of psychosocial development. And here's a picture of that. But where he got this, what shaped it significantly was his interaction with tribes. And so that doesn't get mentioned in our textbook, but that's where it was drawn from. And we can see, you know, by just covering Erickson's own statements that um, this was a, a huge influence. Next slide. So here, <clears throat> they're not just interesting facts of history and Native American influences on psychology, but there's something subtle here, much like when we, when we put, put the biggies of psychological theory, Freud and, and Jung and all these others, 
um, there's something subtle here that can be overlooked pretty, pretty uh, easily. And yet it might be the most powerful takeaway message. And that is of all the studies presented, articles and books written, they've all been written in a unidirectional manner, meaning it's from the white point of view, the Western point of view. And the question here, and this is the takeaway message, is where are the native voices? If they were so influential on Jung, on Maslow, on Erickson, and so on, where are the native voices? What is it that people did not go to native communities and tap into that genius, that understanding, and so on? And then uh, the second question is, what is it about our science that we have only one side recorded? And that's where we move into the next part of this presentation. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about the um, influence of the Western worldview in working with native people. Okay, next slide. This is a, uh, a concept, the space in between. Um, I got this from a fellow named Timothy Day who was a marriage counselor in Denver. And he said that when he counseled couples, um, he didn't really see each person as his client, but more so that space in between because something had happened in their relationship in that space in between that uh, created problems in such a way that they were seeking counseling. So it could be you know, uh, an imbalance of power. It could be that it was not um, safe any longer. Maybe one person wasn't nurturing and cultivating that space in between as much, whatever. But he would look at that and say, this is what's gonna be the most telling factor of what's going on uh, between these couples. And so what, uh, what I did was I took this idea and applied it to culture and worldview. And what, there, what has happened historically is that there's this space in between regarding our history uh, and in particular Native American history and white history and all the things that have happened over time has gone into this space in between. And a lot of it can be explained by a very different uh, approach to the world through our different worldviews. Next slide, please. Um, this was Sam Proctor, a medicine man that I, I was uh, privileged to get to know a little bit. And uh, when I was sitting down with him one time, I was wanting to ask how native people um, from our tribe, how they treated depression and anxiety and post-traumatic stress and other kinds of illnesses. And the very first thing he said to me was, Jeff, the Ishtijadi, meaning white man, and, or the Ishtiheki, meaning white man, and the Ishtijadi, meaning the red man, live in two totally different existences. And he was saying to me that if you can't understand the, the worldview of native people you won't be able to understand what I'm trying to tell you about traditional medicine. Um, next slide. So uh, worldview matters. It's important to understand the worldview of tribal people. And in order to do that, you have to set aside your own cultural worldview if you're non-Indian. Um, and I'm not saying that you need to discard it what I'm saying is just set it aside, sort of like taking a lens and moving that lens aside so that you can be open to understanding um, the worldview of uh, native clients. Excuse me. And so um, the reality is that native clients may be unwilling to open up as much about their lives if you're not willing to um, join with them in their understanding of the world. If you take your own Western template and are looking through that as you're working with native clients, um, your, um, your effectiveness is severely limited. I wanna give an example, a couple of examples here. Um, I remember this one client that came in, uh, a Lakota woman, and uh, one of the first things that people would do when they met with me, because I look white, they'd go, uh, how is it that you came about working here? And they want to know who I was. Who's this white guy at this native 
uh, counseling center. And so I would introduce myself in the native way. I'm, I'm Jeff King. I, um, I am a, an enrolled member of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma. I belong to the Sweet Potato Clan and our tribal township is New Tulsa near Holdenville. That's where my family originated. And they're like, okay, now I know who you are. You could just see their shoulders just kind of relaxing like, oh, okay, he's Indian. It reminds me when I was at the Taos Pueblo, uh, my mom came to visit and I took her around to show her the hospital. She was a nurse and I thought she'd like to see Indian Health Service. Um, and uh, after I'd showed her around, introduced her to some of my friends that were staff, um, one of the staff members came to me the next day and said, all the people here, they're talking, they're, they saw your mom and they were like, Dr. King, he's an Indian. Uh, and they were excited about that. And my caseload just grew after that, uh, just by knowing that I was native. Um, but anyway, this one example, this Lakota woman, after I introduced myself, you could see her shoulders let down. And uh, she said, well, my family is spiritual in the Red Road. And I said, yeah, I, I do understand some of that. And she said, um, they, uh, they go to Sweat Lodge weekly. Uh, I'm not able to do that now that I'm living here in Denver. They're hard to find. And I said, wow, Sweat Lodge is so powerful. Um, that's really cool that your parents have been able to do that. And when she saw that I, that I saw and respected her way, she burst into tears and she started talking about how uh, uh, all the men in her life had died, her brothers, her uncles, her grandparents, her grandfathers, and so on. And that they come to her in spirit and they try to comfort her, but it's still hard for her to find comfort. And I bring that up as an example, because I think if you were to approach this from a Western worldview and so on, I don't know that she would have told this story. But when she felt comfortable with me understanding um, the worldview of the Lakota <clears throat> and the spiritual practices, then it was safe. It was safe for her to tell this story, which was the most important story going on for her, this uh, unresolved grief, this complicated grief. Another example was when I worked among the Taos Pueblo is that um, she, one woman came in and instead of sitting in the chair, she would stand at the door to go out of the office. She would stand at the door and put her head against the door and uh, talk about her mother who had just passed away. She wouldn't look at me. She just stayed there and told stories about her mother and so on. And as, after a certain point, she'd go, okay, thank you. And then she'd leave and we'd never looked at each other and so on. But she could tell I respected and accepted that that was her way of going about it. I see we're short on time, so I'm not going to use this other example. I'm going to move um, to the next slides, uh, try to use just a few more minutes here. Uh, go ahead and tap it again, Brian. Um, and again, this is, I like to think in pictures, and this is to me a really nice picture. It's <clears throat> kind of simplistic, <clears throat> but I do think it captures pa patterns of culture that this is um, the Western view of uh, humans, that we're superior to the rest of creation and we're to dominate and master all that is below us. I could go into talking about Plato and Aristotle and how they reinforce these views and how it manifests itself through Western history, but we don't have time for that. But with indigenous thought, they don't, they don't see humans in the same way. They see humans as part of creation. The Lakota terminology, mitakie oyasin, which means uh, all my relatives or we are all related, captures what this is about, is that it's not that we're on top and you're beneath us, that we're all in relationship to one another. There's a very huge difference in worldview. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick example, a Cherokee chief was meeting with a British admiral to sign a treaty. And when they met, the admiral showed up with all his military men and the Cherokee showed up with their women and families. And the first thing that the speaker said was, where are your women? And he realized that this was an out of balance people. 
because they only had their men. And he, he deduced that there could only be destruction coming out of a treaty where there was such imbalance between the peoples. And that is the native worldview played out in real life. And I think that this chief was entirely right in his assessment. Next slide. And you'll have copies of these slides so that you can look at them more uh, in detail. Don Fixico, a uh, fellow tribal member, um, basically when they asked, you know, what's the difference between worldviews, uh, he said the linear mind, which is the white mind, looks for cause and effect, but the Indian mind seeks to comprehend relationships. And that is a, uh, a foundational part of worldview and the differences between um, Western worldview and indigenous worldview. Next slide. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but to me, I created a uh, Venn diagram to show the differences by contrast between a, the values under Western worldview and indigenous worldview. Uh, and they're, they're contrasted like hierarchical versus shared, linear versus holistic, superior versus equal. And you can go through that and, and see um, how that might play out in real life. Next slide. Um, here's an example of that Western worldview thinking of itself as superior. This was Alan Kasdan, president of the American Psychological Association. At this conference, he said, we want to develop evidence-based treatments for individuals of diverse ethnicities and cultures, not only within our country or continent, but for diverse peoples of the world. It's really nice uh, in terms of his intention, but if you think about it a little bit, you'll see this play out of differences in worldview. Next slide. There's three major implications that reflect this Western scientific superiority. We implies Western scientists want to develop evidence-based treatments. It, it implies that non-served cultures haven't developed their own effective practices. And it implies that these countries and cultures have not been actively involved in addressing the psychological needs of their people over time. And so it, on the surface, it's well-intentioned, yet it's extremely dangerous because it relegates all other ways of knowing to an inferior status, and it ignores thousands of years of uh, knowledge building by these different cultures. Next slide. Next, hit it again. So the basic dynamic here that exists through our educational systems, our mental health systems, our mental health theories, and so on, is that it's the Western approaches that we need to come around to, which are all anchored in Western worldviews, but North American indigenous people need to come around to Western approaches in order to be valid. And so basically what we're doing with our clients is we're requiring them to become white in order to get better. And that's just not right. Next slide, please. Um, there, are, there are practices used in therapy and counseling that can be used, but what's important to me is, uh, I just lost the your screen, thank you, um, is that if you, if you remember in third grade when you did the experiment on osmosis and you had the carnation in the vase with clear water, carnation stays white, but when you dip it in ink, you can see the ink going up and turning the petals blue. To me, Western theories, in order to be useful and not colonized, what we need to do is see if we can anchor them in a traditional indigenous worldview. And if we see that it can actually be anchored in that indigenous worldview, and it's from that that we present our interventions, then those theories can be useful. But if they can't be anchored in that way, I would question them. Next slide, please. Yeah, let's just skip this one and go to the next one. Here's just a, an example of indigenous knowledge, thanks to Richard uh, and Ethleen Two Dogs for, pre, for providing this slide. But you can see here a very holistic view of child rearing and the stages of development 
I don't have time to go into it, but even singing to the unborn baby um, that you create a positive environment around the mother. Um, there are blessing of the womb ceremonies and so on. Um, grandmother is involved. A name is, is given after, after the birth. And you can just see how um, these stages of life development are integrated with adults and with spirituality. Um, and we won't have time to go into that more. Um, next slide. And we'll just go through these really quick. Um, so what is, what, what is the takeaway here um, in behavioral health? What first and foremost is really an attitude that you hold within yourself. You have to become familiar with indigenous ways of knowing. We have to dis dis disentangle ourselves from the existing Western dominant narratives and seek to understand the world through an indigenous perspective. And in doing so, we have to focus on our attitude and examine our own relationship to space and time. Next slide. What kind of energy do we exhibit in the space we inhabit and in our relationships? Because if we have that dominant energy, that forceful energy, that doesn't work in Indian country. Indian country, it's invitation and waiting um, and respect. So we need to examine our relationship to power and examine whether we truly listen to the voices of our people, of our community. And in all counseling and treatment approaches, we must be, you know, that, that diagram that I had with the arrow of coming around to Western ways of thinking, in all our approaches, we must be reversing those effects. And rather than coming around to a Western way, let's root ourselves in the indigenous way. And then uh, next slide. So we, we need to recognize that there's a huge disconnect between our training. And that's the thing, when you look at this, no one gets this in their training in graduate programs and so on, our undergraduate program. We don't get this. We have to learn it in our communities or if we're lucky to have mentors. But be familiar with the space in between all that has happened. And finally, do the work on yourself. That's where the work needs to happen first and foremost. And then final slide from me. Uh, Mado, thank you very much for your attentiveness to this. So I'll turn it over to the presenters, the facilitators. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> that was super awesome. And we don't have time to do this part, but uh, Olivia Davis put it in the chat. Uh, so that's great. You all will receive a copy of this entire PowerPoint and a way to access the recording uh, if you want to share it with your staff or other people. Um, we know we're a little bit past the hour, but if you can go to the next one more slide, I think. Uh, we always begin every session with a video and we end with a video. So if you have a few minutes to hang on, um, I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. King for this fabulous information. It's so. I like the way you use the tectonic tet shifts with the uh, young uh, Maslow and Erickson. And uh, Jeff and I have often said that it's important to remember that Western worldview impacts science, science impacts training, training impacts your credentials, and that can all result in a disconnect with Native patients. So paying attention to that is super powerful and um, happy, so happy you all could join us. Be safe, and we're going to close. So I hope to see you next month. Same time, same place. Um, Hi, my name is Donette Ray. Go ahead. That's it. Hey, I'm a Native American girl, and today you're about to get schooled. We've evolved and, you know, not all of us lived in teepees. Teepees for, were made for only travel uses. Well, we own one, but we don't live in it. <laughs> we don't live in it. We just camp in it whenever we want to. We use them for things like ceremonies or camping and such, but we don't live in them. I have to say to that, where is my check? We really don't get anything for free. Everything we everything we get, we have to work for it, just like everybody else. If we had free health care, then the diabetes and heart disease rate would be very, very low. But at this point in time, it's very high. Our dad works to provide for us. 
we, we don't get like money or anything. We get schooling for free. That's not true either. We have to meet the same academic requirements as any other ethnicity. We still have to apply for scholarships. <laughs> I thought it was just Donald Trump that didn't pay taxes. If we were rich off of casinos, why would we need government money? I think that we just mostly lose our money to casinos. We all gamble. <laughs> Not all Native Americans wear headdresses. In some tribes, they don't wear them at all. In my tribe, we don't wear headdresses and we never did. Women don't wear headdresses and you have to earn them. It wasn't just given to them or handed down to them. You have to earn every feather that makes up that headdress. If you were to buy a headdress, there would be, that would be disrespectful because there's no meaning behind it. You didn't do anything to earn it. All you did was pay for it. That's racist. And a lot of people say that the red skin term comes from the color of our skin, but if you look at me, I'm not red. <laughs> Society is just played into it like the word red skin is okay when it's not. The word redskin came about from the scalping of Native Americans. Redskin means the blood that was dripped from down on their faces. That's a major league sports team and their their argument as their argument against changing the name would be just like me having a conversation with my mom and my mom asked me, Why don't you like Brussels sprouts? Because I don't. It's not like we have a mascot that's called White Man. <laughs> in a way that's making fun of our culture and who we are and we're human beings just like everybody else. I love that video. Um, we want to just close with this one because um, with the recent incident at the Disney, uh, Disney World and uh, just to hear the voices of young, young Native women and the link will be included when you receive the slides. So Brian. Yes, please don't forget to do the survey that is going to populate uh, once you exit the meeting. And it's also been shared in the chat uh, by Emily Field. And, then, and if you have any follow up questions, just email either Bernice uh, Jordan or myself. And our email addresses are on the screen. And then one more slide. The last slide. See you in April, the fourth Tuesday. So it's going to be Understanding Na uh, Native Help Declining and Help Seeking with Dr. Martinez and Mike Duncan. So have a good one, everybody. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Be Thank safe. You, everybody. Bye.